coming up next. Stay tuned to learn more about the state of blockchain education at major universities all around the world. Reimagine 2020. Jared Wynn. I'm the Senior Vice President of Charity at Binance. Glad to be here at Reimagine 2020. Hey everybody, it is Patrick McLean here, uh, one of your hosts for Reimagine 2020. Uh, whatever point you're tuning into here in the 72-hour marathon, uh, as you know, we've been having a lot of really interesting conversations, right? Like, whether it's from a legal perspective or, you know, startups, technologists, mathematicians, university directors, uh, you kind of name it. We brought everybody together. I can say, because I've been doing a lot of these, this would be the first one we've done around philanthropy, right? And, and kind of from a charity perspective. Um, so before I butcher it too much, and, I, and, I, and I'll be careful to, uh, to not do that, uh, I want to introduce uh, Jared Wynn. And uh, Jared, uh, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself, tell everybody a little bit about what you do and uh, maybe how you got into blockchain. Sure. Uh, my name is Jared Wynn. I'm the Senior Vice President of Charity here at Binance. I specifically focus on the philanthropic and charitable initiatives for Binance. I've been in blockchain space about four years, more or less, joined it out of passion, and then that passion grew into something of a career. And that said, I'm very fascinated with the technology, particularly with how it pertains to philanthropy. Um, and I think that philanthropy is one way that we'll be able to really bring a, a, a bright and positive light to blockchain technology. So happy to be here, and I'm looking forward to discussing this more. Love it. And, uh, and it's probably not, it's something that like, I feel like, I feel like I kind of know a decent amount about blockchain, but like, I would be lying if I said I, I really truly understand the connections between, you know, philanthropy and charity work and, you know, that transparency and kind of what the value added is, but I'll, I'll let you explain it. But, you know, before we go to that path, do you mind kind of telling everybody like, what was your career path leading up to this? Like, I kind of, how did you land here? And, uh, and, and, you know, what were your past experiences you feel like that kind of brought you to this point? Yeah, so my my career has been definitely a bit of a hop around, I guess you could say. I, for the last 10 years, I've been working at various tech startups throughout the Silicon Valley um, in capacities of entry-level marketing all the way up to executive-level marketing, sales, business development. And it wasn't until about three years ago that I actually uh, branched off and really started my own business, uh, both in the nonprofit space as well as in the consulting space. And I really found my passion to be most aligned with philanthropy. And when I found that Binance Charity uh, existed, for one, and that Binance had that charity and that philanthropic reach, um, I really wanted to immerse my, immersify myself into it. So what turned into, um, or what was initially a, a, just a hobby of day trading, learning about crypto, learning about blockchain became uh, more of a lifestyle. And with that, uh, it took me some time to really understand blockchain and really kind of understand the fundamentals of it um, and learn that it was more than just Bitcoin uh, and really start to learn how these applications could impact the world. And I think that, you know, especially in the last few months with what we've been going through with the pandemic, I think that there's a lot more um, uh, optimism around what blockchain can really do to change the world. So that's kind of where I'm at now. And I think that Binance Charity's vision and our mission really closely align with some of the I guess, overarching goals of what we could come out of this pandemic with. Got it. Um, and, and just for anybody that isn't aware, right, maybe for the people listening, maybe you are aware of uh, Binance's, uh, you know, charity initiatives, uh, maybe you're not. Uh, but do you mind explaining to the audience, like, like, what is Binance Charity? What attracted you to it? And, and, and why is it? Why is it innovative? Sure. So Binance Charity is actually uh, one, probably one of the only uh, charity foundations that is based on blockchain technology itself. Um, to back up just a moment, I guess you could say that, um, in my opinion, blockchain technology is 
uh, kind of a solution of trust. It eliminates that human variable of behavior as to whether or not somebody will act in one direction or the other. Um, and in this case, a blockchain promotes transparency, immutability, and keeps people honest, uh, ultimately. So our vision is, is to really promote transparency within philanthropy, which is probably one of the largest issues um, in philanthropy is, is that once you make a donation to a charity, seldom do you ever know um, where those funds are used or if, it, or if they were even used in the in the ways that you intended. So with blockchain technology for the first time, we can show without a doubt that funds are being appropriated in the fashion that was intended. Um, now with that, we, we are hopeful that people will actually see that blockchain is more than just Bitcoin or uh, more than just an illicit activity scheme. It's actually something that can really change the way that we interact with each other, the way that we transfer value uh, between one another. Uh, so with that, the, our hopes are that we can show people that blockchain can really make an impact on the world and that, you know, it, we hope that it will even further the adoption of cryptocurrency at large. So with everything that we do, we ensure that there's an element of blockchain technology in it to not only just use blockchain, but to prove people that the philanthropy that they've been intending is being achieved. Got it. And, and, and uh, I guess uh, and maybe I'm a little bit naive too, but like when did uh, Binance Charity come about and, and, and what have, you know, what have, what's been the growth there? Like what have you guys achieved uh, since you've gone live? Sure. So Binance Charity has been around for the better part of two years now. Um, in the last year or two specific years specifically, we've done a, a lot. And even before that, um, we've done a lot of work in Africa. We've also just really uh, done a ton of work with res respect to COVID-19. Um, and thus far, I think we've raised about $10 million worth of donations, and that's growing monthly. So for ex example, with COVID-19, uh, we've effectively raised about $4 million to date. Um, at which point we've been utilizing those for PPE supplies for medical personnel and first responders. So we can actually show through blockchain technology uh, that these funds that we've been receiving are being appropriated specifically to hospitals, countries, and uh, medical personnel. And with that, we've provided uh, millions of masks and other vital needs to medical personnel uh, and ensuring that they are protected during this very uncertain time. So, and by the way, good job. This is why I like these kind of conversations, right? Like, uh, these are things we should be supporting for everybody watching, right? Like, these are the these are the fun conversations. Like, these are things that we can all get behind, right? Like, we want to understand how to deploy our, our cryptocurrencies, right, or the assets that we hold. Like, th these are the things that you can actually do, right, without without any 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 recourse, like non profit motive, right? And 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 if you care about blockchain and you're holding it and you want to be a good person. Uh, if you want to be a little bit selfish, it actually proves the technology at the same time, right? Um, yep. So it's coming to my next question, do you guys deploy a lot of those resources yourselves or do you find that you're working with, you know, uh, external parties to kind of help them update their processes? So as of now, most of the processes that we've done have been internally based, um, but we do work with other large partners. An example of this being is we last year hosted a project called the Pink Care Token, which was for period poverty, which uh, prior to me learning about this project, I didn't realize was such a, a, an issue. And with this, uh, specifically in Uganda is where we did it. We worked with Mercy Corps. And in Uganda, uh, one of the big issues uh, with women is, is that they cannot receive sanitary pads or anything of that. And if you can imagine what it's like to be going through puberty without having sanitary pads or anything of that nature, they aren't able to go to school, they can't learn, um, and it severely st uh, stifles their their social growth with the, with their peers. So we actually created a token um, in which one token provided a year's worth of sanitary pads uh, to a woman in need. And that token cost was only $4. Um, and when somebody purchased that token, we could show through blockchain technology that that token was sent to the person in need. And then that person in need would redeem it with a vendor who would then exchange that for uh, a year's worth of sanitary pads, all of which was provable and transparent through the blockchain. So this is just kind of a, 
uh, one example of what it is that we've been able to achieve uh, in the projects that we've done with partners. And in the future, we do anticipate as well doing a significant amount uh, more with uh, other NGOs. Our vision isn't just for Binance Charity to do uh, blockchain-related uh, philanthropy. Our vision is, is to help NGOs and educate them on blockchain while helping them to adopt it for their own initiatives. Um, we feel that the philanthropy space needs to be kept honest. And in this way, uh, there's no better way to do it than being completely transparent and you know showing exactly everything that people need to see to know that philanthropy is being made the way that they intended. 100%. It's a great use case. When you, when you guys approach external organizations, like what have you found are, you know, how, how do they perceive it? Uh, is this something they're able to grasp quickly or there's like some internal barriers, maybe a fixed like with other perceptions where it kind of like they have a pause or they're just open arms. And, and what, what lessons have you guys learned through that process? So I think that it's just with anyone. If you go up to somebody and ask them if they've heard about Bitcoin, there's going to be apprehensions to it. People are going to immediately kind of go back to Bitcoin, my friend that lost their house, or that story I read about somebody losing their mortgage and going under because they invested in this. Um, people tend to flock more towards the things that they're afraid of when they think about something. And when people think blockchain, they think Bitcoin. So there's, um, there's definitely an immediate apprehension that has to be overcome. But that said, I would say that over the last six months alone, uh, there's been a significant shift in that, in which people are more open to learning about this. And I think that, you know, there's always a need for somebody to make change and it's, they're going to have incentive or they're going to have mandate. Incentive for people to learn about Bitcoin was to make money. The mandate to learn about blockchain is, is that the system that we have right now is not efficient and there's definitely a need for it. So I think that there's an openness to learn about this, but there's oftentimes a, a very large barrier to entry in which not only is this quite obvious that it's the solution for many changes, but there's the educational barrier that you have to overcome before getting to that. And so whenever there's a, any type of sales process of adoption, there's the education. And with blockchain, um, it, it oftentimes involves larger parties. Uh, there's technicals, there's as well as the higher ups, uh, and it's a, quite a large adoption process. But what we have found, as I mentioned recently, is, is that there's interest in it. So I think that it's just a matter of being equipped to overcome those questions and being able to communicate effectively as to the, the value propositions of blockchain technology and how it can change and otherwise impact the way that they do business, whether that be from saving money or whether that be from really just proving their trust methods. Well, I can, I can say if, uh, from my perspective, you, you're doing a good job of communicating this effectively. Um, you know, I, 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 I personally, I, I, when I was, I don't know, 10 years ago, I lived in Tanzania for many years. So I, I lived in East Africa and, and I've seen, I, I've personally seen like, and just heard stories where either whether it's clothes being sent or money being sent or money or resources getting misappropriated. Right. And where I think you guys are, are kind of selling this or not, not that you guys are right. Which is like the inherent benefit of blockchain technology is that like we can eliminate or add transparency and eliminate fraud or misappropriation. You know, obviously there's another side to that coin, right? Which is that there are a bunch of parties probably like in, in some really fixed systems that don't want transparency, right? If we were to say that the reason we want to instill transparency is, is because of there's some actors kind of, you know, going against uh, what we think is goodwill. Um, have you guys seen pushback there from like entities you would say that are like, they really like, they're like, uh Oh, the transparency police are in town. Like, like, what have you guys seen there? Uh, so quite clearly, there's going to be opposition from certain parties in this. Um, it's going to be opposition from the people that either are going to have to change the way that they do business or the people that might not have a job as a result of this implementation. So it's, it's very unique. I've spoken previously that, you know, in this world, most everything is mathematical. Um, humans are one of the few things that cannot be very well predicted in our random in nature in which we don't really know how a human is going to behave in one direction or the, the other. There might be a probability, but there's no guarantee. Um, so when it comes to actually working with some organizations, uh, there's definitely 
organizations that aren't going to want this transparency in their business. And it's going to be one of those things that either they, I think eventually, either they're going to have to adopt it or they're going to be left in the dust by their competitors who are clearly willing to do this. Um, so while there has been, I, there's, it's one of those unique things where nobody's going to come right out and say, I don't want transparency because what we're doing is corrupt. Um, but there has been situations where we've tried to work with other organizations and they've been less than interested in doing this. Um, but that said, I think that o the larger majority of people that are or organizations are interested in adopting this technology. I think it's just a matter of how. And we have actually, Binance has created what's called the Binance Academy. Uh, the Binance Academy is intended not only to educate the masses about blockchain technology, but also enter enterprise and government units. So we hope that in the long term that Binance can be a staple and kind of the, the baseline foundation of the pyramid of learning um, in which there's going to, we know that there's going to be a large barrier to entry for many organizations, but we welcome that. And uh, we're hopeful that we can uh, really help the world at large and uh, get some of this new technology in their organizations and make change in the way that we feel that it can be made. Got it. Um, you mentioned earlier that, uh, you know, ex a example or use case, however you want to refer to it, where, you know, people are taking a token or someone's donating a token in. Uh, they're either, I'm assuming, converting fiat or some form of cryptocurrency to uh, let's just call it donation token uh, and then and you give the example that that people are, are might re redeem them for like hygiene products um, so in this scenario where uh, you know people are kind of redeeming a, a, a digital asset for a physical good is that kind of the common use case you guys are finding or you know are there are there moments where people are kind of piping in digital assets and then they want to convert them back to fiat you know where, where they need to deploy it you know on the ground um, how, how do you guys kind of look at that, those, those myriad of, of kind of the, the, the last mile, I guess, of the, of the, of the, of the donation? So uh, I think the way that we approach everything is, is everything starts with a problem. What is the problem that we're trying to solve? What are the problems of this transaction? And like, what, in what ways can blockchain solve it? Um, so I'll give one example, and this is a use case that wasn't necessarily something that came to fruition. Um, but if we had four months leading up to COVID to prepare it, we probably would have deployed it. We absolutely would have. Um, one specific use case was an NFC tamper seal in which um, when there's a supply chain specifically, there's, there's opportunities for tampering. Um, there's opportunities for things to change, opportunities for people to be deceitful and otherwise not tell the exact truth of the, the supply chain. Um, in this case, there was a major issue with PPE supplies getting to the hospitals. And by the time they were sent from point A all the way to the hospital, um, the, the products were swapped in which there were counterfeit goods that were replaced in place of uh, the uh, otherwise original and uh, quality products. This didn't happen to us, but we had we've heard of many situations where hospitals were not receiving goods at the quality that was intended. Um, this specifically, there was a NFC tamper seal uh, that we were able to put on some of these boxes. Uh, again, this didn't happen, but it was something that we wish we could have done, uh, in which every user upon receiving these boxes would scan it and it would stamp on the blockchain that the seal was not broken and that it was received by that person as it should have been. Um, and at the end, the, the record would show that the seal was never broken and that the goods were left intact. Now, in that situation specifically, uh, we were able to show kind of that honesty model in which the goods were never changed from point A to point B. And if there was a quality issue, then that was on the manufacturer versus somebody who had their hands in the process throughout the entire flow. Now, there's to tie back to your question on that, there's so many use cases of blockchain and so many different ways that people can leverage it. We try to keep things as as much as possible on the ledger. Uh, but the problem at, that you're re referencing is, is that typically there's an off ramp to fiat. And that's kind of that very last mile as to where do the funds go after the fact. And we, we, while we aren't at that space yet to be able to show uh, where the funds are actually spent in every situation, we try to cover as much as possible with blockchain technology. And our hopes are that in the coming years, we'll be able to have a completely closed system. Uh, an example of this is like food stamps, for example. Uh, food stamps are a, a 
product that can only be used in a very closed system and for a very specific set of goods. The things that, that food stamps has in its support is, is government adoption in which vendors are now required to use or basically accept food stamps. It's very difficult to, at a cryptocurrency scale, force vendors to accept cryptocurrency. And that's kind of the last mile that we're missing in this situation in which we can't force people to accept cryptocurrency. So sometimes the utility of crypto um, gets to the point where fiat needs to be exchanged. And what we try to do to overcome that is, is that we'll show oftentimes for mask orders or things of that, we'll attach invoice or purchase orders to our, our ledger to be able to show that the exact amount of funds that were converted in cryptocurrency were used to pay a purchase order for X dollars and kind of balance that book in that way. Um, so in that way, I think that there's always opportunity for blockchain to cover a majority of the process and really show that integrity. Uh, and there's, in time, I hope that the entire process, 100%, will be able to be captured. And, and, and just kind of, I, I guess, uh, zoom out, maybe unpack that a little bit. Like, what do, you, what do you think that makes Binance uniquely positioned to tackle this problem in a meaningful way? That's a great question. I, when I first started at Binance Charity, it was actually about three months before I really wanted to do a philanthropy initiative. I wanted to do something that could show people what blockchain could do. Um, in crypto and blockchain specifically, there's uh, a lot of, I guess you could say there's sometimes not the best of intentions uh, in what people are trying to achieve with different ICOs or IEOs. We're kind of past that phase at this point, but there has to be something of a brand behind anything for people to even look twice at it. Binance, I believe, has one of the best brands in crypto and one of the most trustworthy brands in crypto. Now with that, I think that there always has to be some sort of trust or some sort of credibility behind any type of initiative. I think that for people to look at something, that's what Binance is able to provide. And then beyond that, I think people will start to learn the blockchain technology and realize that it really, after, if blockchain is used in the way that it should be, credibility and trust is no longer an issue. Uh, but for people to even look and consider it, I think that a brand at first is necessary. I think that's where Binance is uniquely positioned to overcome some of these barriers. Got it. Um, so I kind of want to move to the next point. Like, and, and obviously I think we're, we're in a very interesting time in, in human history, right? Like you know, world governments are, everybody's on lockdown. There's, uh, you know, uh, like health concerns, right? Uh, we're, we're worried about travel. I think, people's jobs are starting to become affected, right? Which is, you know, we don't know the full effects yet, but I think we'll, we're gonna see some blowback from that, right? Whether it's how pe people are gonna need support, they're kind of relying on the governments right now um, to deploy this at first, right? So that's kind of the first line of defense, but I think as we've got the next few months, uh, we might find like, you know, public and, and private organizations kind of have a role there to fill as well to kind of, you know, meet demand uh, of the help people need. But like, do you guys view that what we're seeing right now, whether it be COVID or, 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 you know, however you want to define it, is this bringing to the table? And I, and I know you mentioned a few portions of it earlier, like how you guys would have tackled PPE and stuff like that. But like, do you feel like right now is like a really interesting time to deploy this? Uh, you know, and, and I guess, yeah, we'd like to hear your thoughts there. Yeah. So I think that in this situation with COVID, there's many opportunities arising that blockchain can solve. And I think that there's, a, a significant amount of friction in which there's a clear case now in ways that blockchain technology could have solved some of the issues that we're experiencing. And I think that now it goes back to that incentive or mandate. Uh, in this case, there's a significant amount of incentive for blockchain technology to be adopted. And in this case as well, I think that had we had a lot of this uh, technology already implemented, I think that we would have experienced a much more fluid, um, I guess, conversion in which there wouldn't have been nearly as many issues with, uh, I guess, you know, record immutability, people owning their data, uh, people being able to really kind of, at a certain point, I think that, I think that blockchain really could have changed a lot of what we do. And right now, for example, I'll, get, I'll give an example. My children who are in second and fourth grade, 
uh, for the first time are doing video conferencing uh, with their with their teachers. That might not have been something that happened for the next 10 years, 20 years, for people to be able to really use video conferencing um, in the ways that we, we really could have done today. Now, we're in a position where we didn't have anything but a choice. Technology was there, and now the older traditional systems are being forced to adopt this new technology in a time of need. I think that blockchain, we're going to run into very similar situations. And we also saw very similar um, with just Hurricane Dorian, for example, um, really obliterated a significant amount of, of structure that we had in place. Um, FEMA was unable to really distribute their funds in a way that was effective. We were talking months and months before contractors could receive their funds to, to really start to rebuild uh, the damages that were done. And if not for blockchain in this situation, if we had blockchain in this situation, we could have done this within minutes of, tra of a transfer of funds. And it could have all been done without trusted third parties. It could have been done on the ledger. So I think that in this situation specifically, um, there's a lot of wish we had moments, like if only we had this, but I think that out coming out of this situation, we'll have a lot of opportunity where, okay, this is what we should have had in place. Now let's do it. And what will it take to do it? So we, we have a lot more of a call to action now than I think that we ever had. Got it. And, uh, so uh, one question I have is, it, you know, and I hear like a few aspects of what you're saying, right? So you're, you're talking a bit about like NFC, uh, tamper free seals where like cut the transistors. So this uh, would show like broken, therefore open, um, you know, you guys are validating kind of the, the, the path of, of, of resources, right? Like uh, where they start, where they get handed off to it's kind of the end, call it end bill of sale or however you wanted to think about it. So, you know, do you guys look at it or have you deployed where those individual transactions where the blockchain is going to help kind of validate them and, and kind of give a global view of, of what was the truth of what happened, but as individual parties kind of show that they are accurately validating transactions, are you guys leaning to anything where that starts to build a reputation for certain parties where, where therefore, you know, that it kind of feeds back in where that, you know, outside of the individual trans transactions that it kind of feeds back into a charity. And you could say, these guys are trustworthy. I've seen them do a billion transactions and, and, and it kind of develops a reputation uh, score. To, I mean, uh, that's, I know it's a little bit of a co uh, con controversial term in some aspects, but like develop a reputation for some of these organizations. I, I absolutely think so. And I think that the organizations that are adopting blockchain technology at an early phase as it is, are the ones that will be at the forefront of this techno technological revolution. Now, with that, I think that companies such as Mercy Corps that we're working with, I think that they already have that in mind, knowing that these things really need to be understood and adopted in order for them to be at the front of the next industrial revolution. Now, with that, I think that the credibility will be in place as these will be the pioneers of this industry. It'll just be as if, you know, Apple being one of the first technology companies to sell computers on the internet, well, that was laughed at many years ago. Um, in this case, I think that NGOs, nonprofits, um, just overall enterprises, the ones that are currently exploring blockchain technology, I think will be the, the early adopters and well positioned in this next industrial revolution. So with all of that, I think that credibility itself, um, I think that there has to be a better understanding of the mass public for that credibility really to take place. Because even if you see a news article showing, you know, say grandma or grandpa reads an article about a company adopting blockchain technology and why and now how they are a trustworthy organization. Well, what does it matter if grandma and grandpa doesn't know what blockchain does? Um, I think that there has to be very specific use cases for people to really understand the, the impact that's being made. And it was, um, it took me a long time to really understand blockchain. I mean, I'm a, I'm a techie person. I, at least I consider myself one. I don't code or anything of that. But I had to read a story about a tuna fish to really understand blockchain technology. And uh, that tuna fish story is what really kind of helped me understand the reason or the need for it. And in that story, it was about a tuna fish going from Fiji to the United States. And I didn't understand a supply chain process very well. Um, but in this, there was specifically an IoT sensor uh, that was placed in the box of the tuna fish. And if the temperature raised above a certain percent or a certain degree, uh, it stamped the blockchain notifying that the, the goods were contaminated because bacteria was then residing in the tuna fish. 
Um, without that technology, it was there was no incentive for anybody in that process to say, while I was holding this tuna fish, that the temperature raised above this degree, because at that point they would have been liable to pay for all of the tuna fish. Uh, nobody wants to do that. So in this case, uh, specifically, it kept people honest and they were able to see specifically when the temperature rose above a certain degree. So that type of story for me is what made it click. And I think that there has to be some true um, translation for the mass public to really understand what blockchain is, or it's going to be that situation where blockchain's being used and nobody knows about it. Um, so in either case, I think that there has to be a better understanding at large uh, for people to really get that credibility boost from the organizations or really think that organizations are having more credibility. Um, but I think that with time that will change as technology evolves and progresses. No, love it. And uh, I'm, I'm, I have a background a long time ago in like RFID sensors from when I started a company in like running events, like marathons, where everybody used to put on RFID tags. And it's kind of the next thing, okay, how do we deploy it to something else now? And kind of went to many other industries. So I, I definitely appreciate it. And I think it's one of the things people don't understand about blockchain. I think they, and I always see it with supply chain. They're like, blockchain will solve your supply chain problems. And I'm like, no, right? And like I explain to companies, I'm like, you already have pro you like you already have processes in place in your supply chain where it's like you inherently don't trust people right like you get a product from a farmer and then you order lab results right so like, they're they're already building yeah. in all these validation methods so it's not or or testing methods etc so it's not that they're ever gonna we should ever this isn't that we should just it's gonna lead to trust it's just that it's, it's in regards to the validation stage, where, right? It's like, if humans are the element that can create chaos, right? Like what these little sensors do at times are kind of take that mystery out of it. Now, what's interesting about what you mentioned, like the N NFC tag, and, and I think a lot of people don't know that, like those type of tags, like it gets broken, it breaks the electronic sensor and the, the electronics doesn't work anymore, right? So uh, that, that tag no longer gives a read. Um, so I totally hear what you're saying there, actually. And, 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 and you know, I, again, I kind of lead this conversation I wouldn't, I would be lying if I said like I've sat probably for even the length of this conversation, right. And thought about charity and, and I'm kind of a, you know, a bit inspired. And, and I think your ability to really clearly communicate this, and I've actually been impressed throughout this conversation. Um, give this guy, give this guy a charity raise Binance. This guy does a good job. <laughs> um, but, you know, I feel like you guys, from what I'm hearing, it sounds like you guys are, are kind of building the infrastructure or the processes you guys are investing in, you know, the learnings it takes to kind of understand how to kind of fulfill, um, you know, the entire delivery method, whether it be fiat or, or products, uh, both from the person donating to kind of the end, end receiver. Are you guys aggregating in any way lists of charities? Like, like for anybody watching that wants to like go donate money through Binance Charity, is there a list or a directory that they can go find of, 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 of options to kind of deploy? Yeah, so if you actually, if you visit Binance.Charity and go to our donut, donate page, you'll, you'll see a significant amount of projects that we're working on, both COVID, Australia bushfires, Notre Dame projects. Uh, there's a significant amount of them that we're working on, and you make the donations directly. Um, as of currently, the only donations that we're accepting is in cryptocurrency, but in the coming months, we actually have a fiat on-ramp that will be established to enable a greater audience to participate and donate without having to know how to send crypto from one public address to another, so to speak. Um, so with all of that, you'll be able to see every project that we're working on, the donation records, how those donations are allocated, and the entire journey of that process. Um, and with that as well, um, I open my arms to anybody who is really interested in getting involved in the philanthropy space, um, whether that be an individual wanting to make an impact with their own contribution or an organization that is interested in adopting blockchain technology. And I think that it's going to be a lot more than just Binance Charity to make this, this, this mission or this vision take place. So again, with that, um, I think that it's going to take a lot of creative and innovative thinkers to really make a change in this space. So I, if anybody has thoughts or questions or even just ideas, you can always reach out to me on LinkedIn, Twitter, any of the above, and I'm always ha happy to help in those ways. Got it. So, Hey, we, I think we only have about uh, two minutes here. And uh, this is one of those conversations that I feel like could probably go on for the next hour. And we could probably have some really interesting points. Um, but, you know, again, I think kind of for the audience, right? I know we have a few thousand students that are watching this, right? Uh, 
it, it, for the for the 19, 20, 21, 22 year old student, right, who's kind of thinking about do they want a career in blockchain or, or uh, how do they want to deploy this, whether for a specific technology they want to build or an, an initiative that they're motivated in supporting. If you could go back in time and like you're at university today, like what would your advice be to, to students? Like how would you think about blockchain and 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 you know through your journey, what what lessons would you kind of try to post to them? I would say always be hungry for knowledge. If there was one thing I would have changed about my college career, I would have toughed it out through a few more coding classes so I could have comprehended it on an even deeper level. Um, I was a math major. I enjoyed math very much. I went into com computer science because it was very lateral. I think that understanding technology at its deepest levels will only be advantageous to anybody that's going through the process of learning right now. Um, so always be avid to learn, read everything about technology because it's going to change constantly and the new generation is gonna be the one that really pivots and ultimately molds it in the way that it needs to be focused. Um, when I was in college, somebody told me that coding was gonna be saturated and that people aren't going to need coders. So I stopped coding. Uh, and now today coders or programmers, software engineers are some of the highest paid um, assets in any organization. So. For those who are not interested in coding, try to understand the fundamentals of it in the least, because they're being able to speak to those levels in uh, in conversations that you would have never expected. Uh, they will rise up. They will occur. So always learn and always be on the forefront of technology. And I think that it will serve everyone well. Love it. Man, I, I can say it's actually been a pleasure. And again, I wanted to reiterate, and, I, and I'm sure everybody enjoyed this conversation. Like, it, I think you explained everything really well and, 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 and very concisely. I've done, I'm not a professional interviewer, but like, like going through this conference, I think I've been on 30, somewhere between 30 and 40 interviews, right, the last few days. And uh, I, I would say I, I'm actually shocked at how concise you literally brought up every point. I got, for That's everybody so listening, for the... For the thousands of students, for the other thousands of general crypto enthusiasts or just normal people watching this, I'm personally, and Jared's going to hold me to this, I'm going to go donate $100 to, I don't know, I haven't looked yet, but to some charity on Binance Charity. Okay, so I encourage everyone else to do it. Jared, I'll follow up with an email. My team, if I don't do it in 24 hours, do you harass me? Um, I will. Yeah, so, but everybody else go there, right? Match me. Come on, 100 people, go match me. We, we, can, we, can, we can bring together, uh, you know, $10,000 at that point, right? And, and, and whether, you can put in, whether you can put in a dollar or $100 or whatever, um, you know, everybody, and I think it's a very interesting time, right? Like, after everybody's been locked in their house for a month plus, maybe two months, I, I think it's a, a really interesting time in humanity where people kind of, like, they've taken a step back. Like, they want to help each other more they're probably more empathetic to what people are going through, right? Where like they're, they're in a position they never thought they would be in. Um, so we probably have like, I hope it's not a small window, right? I hope it lasts longer, but who knows, right? Everybody could get out of their house tomorrow and they're partying on the beach and they forgot about all of this. But, you know, while we still have this kind of context in mind, you know, I think it's a good time to kind of let people know this. So again, Jared, I want to thank you for your time. I think, I think, uh, you know, it sounds like a good cause, obviously a good use case of blockchain. Like if I go check the boxes of blockchain applications, I feel like, I feel like it ticks most of them, like even coming down to how to validate products and boxes, right. Which I'm sure a lot of supply chain people or, or logistics would learn some lessons from. So before we run, uh, any, any last words for the audience? No, I think honestly, you hit a nail on the head is that I think one of the key elements of philanthropy is empathy. And right now we're in a position where we're all empathetic and we can all relate to one, one another as to what we're going through in this world. I think that, you know, this pandemic has united us. And in this case, in this situation, for anybody who's looking to give back, check out our Crypto Against COVID campaign, uh, or you can go to Binance.Charity and look at the Crypto Against COVID campaign. We're currently matching all donations two to one, meaning a donation of $100 immediately will become $300. So there's a lot of opportunity for us to make some impact. That's, that's, that's now, I know, now I know where I'm putting my $100. Exactly, exactly. But this, this conversation has been fantastic. I have to say that you probably brought the best out of me in the, in the conversation. So I thank you for this opportunity. And for anyone listening who wants to make an impact, please feel free to reach out to me. Love it. Well, you made it easy. 
For everybody listening, as you know, we're going 72 hours live. We are not stopping. We have a bunch of interesting people that we're talking to, right? And I hope you guys are enjoying it. And uh, again, I think this is a really interesting conversation. This is a perfect time for all of us to kind of step outside of the box, right? We don't need to fight about like Bitcoin Cash versus Bitcoin SV versus like, let's, let's actually yeah. pivot for a minute and help each other. Like, Talk for things that listen. matter. Yeah. Yeah, right. So, hey, for everybody watching, I uh, appreciate it. And, uh, you know, stay tuned. And, and we'll, I think we're going to have some more interesting conversations come up. Thank you again, Justin. Or, sorry, Jared. <laughs> we can edit that part. Thank you. <laughs> You're tuned in to Reimagine 2020. Stay tuned to learn more about the state of the art in blockchain education and technological development all around the world. Reimagine 2020.